every week I come in here and Tony and I do our best to support the working class on one side of an issue. And Tom, you do your best to support the elite globalists on the other side of an issue. And I got <laughs> tired. I got tired of bashing my head against the wall. So this week I'm going to capitulate. Tom, I'm going to come to your side and I'm going to say, let's replace all the humans. Oh, no. How do you feel about that, Tom? <laughs> oh, no. The, the market needs a new hype. I'm tired. We're, we're not at generative AI yet, but I don't care. It's basically done. A couple of engineers got to put some finishing touches on it. And then we got new digital God brains. So why wait? Uh, you know, who cares about the brain? Let's go to the body. And I saw Elon Musk tweet about this the other day. He was talking, uh, I'll, I'll read you the tweet directly. Tesla will have genuinely useful humanoid robots in low production for Tesla internal use next year and hopefully high production for companies in 2026. Now, Elon Musk is notorious for aggressive timelines, so who knows if that's a little bit optimistic. Yeah. But he did say that the company wanted robots to have a price point below 20000 I'm going to give you a little bit more background on the market size here and also some of the competitors here before we argue whether or not we should just replace ourselves. Why not? We've got the brains. Let's go to the bodies. Uh, this is a little excerpt from Global X ETFs. They run a few ETFs, one of which is BOTS, B-O-T-Z, which covers this theme. It's not the greatest, most liquid product. Uh, but directionally, it has some of the uh, companies that are related to the conversation. Considering the global manufacturing uh, industrial workforce, which will expect to is expected to grow from 250 million workers in 2024 to 400 million by 2035, the industrial humanoids total addressable market is roughly 1.75 trillion. Our estimate assumes that humanoids could potentially impact 35% of workers in most cases by elevating them to more meaningful tasks. That's what they always say, right? With humanoids selling at an average selling price or ASP in the range between 10 to $15,000. That would be a drastic drop in price. Uh, the ASP right now ranges from 30000 to 150000 for a high-end one. And I've got a couple of different companies. If we throw up this second image, are the companies that are actually working on these humanoid robotics. The first one, of course, was Boston Dynamics. They have absolutely sick robot, if you haven't seen that clip. Optimus V2 is the image you just saw a moment ago. Toyota's got one, Agility, Figure AI, and a few others. So, Thomas, I am, I'm coming here and I'm capitulating. I'm not going to fight on the side of unionizing the workforce, which has gone from 20% of the labor force down to 6% of the privatized workforce. I'm not going to advocate for policies that improve the entrepreneur and the everyday working man and the working class of America or the global laborer. Quite frankly, let's go all in, Tom. Let's go all in, globalist. Let's go all in, elite. Why care about uh, the pursuit of civil liberties of the individual when you can just increase your energy output and you got a robot that you don't have to cook? I mean, you don't have to cook for, clean for, provide liberties for, give rights to. Come on, man. Let's go all in. What say you, Tom? Well, I was waiting for this moment because, to be fair, you should be paired up with a robot. <laughs> it would be <laughs> the safest Victor Jones pairing ever. The only person that could deal with you over the long time would be something that was programmed and was, yeah. I mean, you need a robot. I There's no question about it. So I understand how your brain works here. This is so far-fetched. Tell me why this is so good. Tell me why this just in, will enable all of humankind to pursue our greater endeavors. Um, the, the issue, Vic, is that despite what Elon says, we're nowhere close. I mean, the robots still have to learn from somebody, and, and we're continuing to learn ourselves. Yeah, this is, I mean, it, it, it's a nice pipe dream. It sounds good. I mean, the best thing that robot's ever going to do is be able to screw in a, um, eventually they'll figure out how to screw in a license plate and it'll be great. Hmm. Screw in a you know what? I listened to your uh, truth or skepticism with Dylan yesterday, and you echoed sort of a similar s sentiment, which is that AI is never going to be able to do what people think it will be able to do. Like you'll be able to give it simple, simple prompts and you'll get back very complex products back. I, I'm sort of confused a little bit because at heart, you're a technologist. You're pushing yeah. for technological advance. I believe... You know the capabilities of technology, whether it's a year away or 10 years away. I don't really think that matters. The point is we're on the cusp of generative, generative AI. We're on the cusp of humanoid robots. We are developing flying drones. We are developing 
you know, flying vehicles to a certain, or at least amphibious vehicles. We have a miracle pill that we're distributing that in most cases causes, or excuse me, uh, relieves diabetes and other diseases. The future is here, my friend. It might, it, I thought it would feel differently, but the future is here. And I'm sort of curious why you doubt human ingenuity and capabilities that seem to be- right Oh, no, no, I, I don't- I don't doubt any advances in technology. I don't doubt. I don't doubt anything that you just said. I you you brought up. You, you started this discussion by talking about replacement, and yep. it, it's not a replacement. It, if you're mm -hmm. if you're talking about a complement to, of course, I, I'm I am all in 100% bullish on everything you talked about, but not as a replacement. It's never going to replace. It's going to complement. Right. It's going to make everything better, faster more efficient, but it's going to be a complement to, not a replacement for. Yeah, and I, uh, you know, I can be a little bit cynical, Tom, and I love that you're an optimist, and I want to be an optimist with you. There's some part of me that goes. And you can be an optimist, how too. You, you know, Tony, I've just been around the block a couple times. Explain to me how we upskill 8 billion people on the planet. If you've got a generative AI technology that can develop and learn skills faster than a human could, how exactly do you upskill the human being uh, above and beyond the machine? Just well, help me understand how that works. It, you, 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 that's that's what the machines do. That's what that's what a complementary machine does. It speeds up the process. You either you have to become smarter and more efficient in order to survive. You know we're we we are adaptable creatures and. The machines learn from us, so they they can't learn from each other. As much as we want to think they're going to learn from each other, they have, they have to learn. They have to start from somewhere. So what happens is the technology makes us all smarter, and it makes us learn faster, and it gives us a vehicle to learn. We don't have to rely on somebody else to pay for or to. We we don't have to rely on a secondary task for learning, but what the machine does is it complements and it complements the execution of that learning, so that. Again, it's just everything, it speeds everything up. It makes us way more efficient, way more productive. I agree. So what you're basically saying is we're headed to a world where there are less low-skilled jobs and we are going to be hyper-competitive for the fewer jobs which will be available in the future. Would you say that's a it, fair it's not, assessment it's not, of what the future looks like? To create a more competitive and productive No, economy? what's misleading about that is it's not fewer jobs. It's more jobs. See... What success does is it creates more opportunity, not less. So yes, it's going to remove a lot of the lower skilled jobs, but it's going to replace them with higher stat type jobs that I do. It's going to replace them with higher you skilled and me jobs. Both, Tony. So everything goes up. What used to be a low skilled job becomes a high skilled, you know, becomes a higher skilled job. It's just the lower skilled jobs get eliminated. Of course, that's how it works. That's how that's what advancement is. Lower skilled jobs get eliminated. Much more higher skilled jobs get created that are worth more therefore pay more and they create more jobs. That is the essence of job creation. Creating low skilled jobs is not efficient economy. That's let me ask that's me North ask Korea at work. Let me ask you a loaded question. Yeah. Is, is the is the union fit for purpose in our current environment? Of course. In in other words, in a world where there seem to be more elite and global governing institutions, a world where you have, let's say, UAW instead of maybe a more global or at least an, a national sort of organization around protecting human or protecting wages. Do you think the old style of the union is fit for purpose in a more global, globalized economy? I mean, the old style will change. And so the way that unions are run and by who they're run that will change, but the concept of the union in order to negotiate as for worker negotiation for everything from benefits to pay and everything else, uh, it's only going to get stronger because the argument is, is going to be much less subjective. And again, it's going to become a much more efficient argument. You're going to have the statistics to back it up. Rather than saying we are worth X for whatever the reason is, you're going to be able to prove you're worth X plus or potentially because you are going to have all the statistics, everything that you need. You're basically going to be able to put together an instantaneous book showing value down to the penny. The edge that the union busters, the edge that the non-unions, non-union employers used to have is going to be gone because the unions are going to be able to prove what their value is. And you're not going to be able to replace them because, again, everybody's going to have that power. So it's going to be the exact opposite, I think, of what you're thinking. It's going to actually empower 
the the whole you know the movement which which is what you want let's say this it's what the majority of people want no question about it i i sort of feel the opposite i feel like um there's of less and you less do, because you are this is this is who you are you are okay, a cynic explain. i'm a cynic or i'm a realist i think there's optimists who refuse to see the situation as it is and want to see it as they wish it would be i think the reality is that there are hundreds of millions of people out there that that are not going to be able to upskill quick enough. And I don't think we're talking about the plan for those for people. And I think UBI is a horrible solution because it removes the incentive and the drive for human uh, ingenuity, for purpose, and it removes uh, certain incentives that are important. So I think about like what are potential solutions, and I'm going to give you a crazy conspiracy theorist, uh, theory before I get out of here to bring a smile to Tony's face. You guys ready? I'm, I'm going to drop the mic on this one. I think in a weird way our best possibility of organizing it's uh, consumer discretionary. You just saw it today. 30, 30 cents of every dollar in the marketplace right now is run by seven companies. Of those seven companies, six of them are all tied to discretionary income, which is all your cell phones. Only six of you are in unions, but 95% of you have smartphones. If you put them down, you organize, and you say this is what we want as individuals from your elite managerial political class, you might have a shot. What do you think about that, gentlemen? Hold it. Say that again? Sure. So my, my question was, how do you organize in a world, in a more global world, where you're not really organizing against individual corporations, and corporations have massive power? You need to find some leverage. And the leverage, I think, is the fact that almost everybody has a smartphone, and that smartphone drives the economy. And so the leverage is whether or not you use your attention to further the economy or not. And you can choose not to put your attention towards, you, know, you can choose to put down your cell phone, which would give individuals enormous power. So I think in a, where, in a world where you're looking for new ways to organize, I don't think it's the old model. I think a new model is uh, it's around smartphones and attention. Okay, but I don't understand how that's any different. Who cares? I mean, it's still you're still organizing. How, why does that matter, how you organize? What the question originally was, was what do you, basically, what do you think about the future of essentially, you know, organized power, if you want to call it that, or a union, whatever. And I'm, I'm saying it's, it's not going to go away. It's going to get stronger. How you... How you get there, what what the vehicle you use, if it's your cell phone or anything else, why does that matter? That's only going to make it easier. That's the whole point. I don't think I'm disagreeing with you. I think the question I asked before that was, do you think organization in the future looks different than it did in the past? Oh, of course. And I'm just yeah, outlining. I'm just outlining a potential uh, scenario. No, no, I didn't. I thought you didn't. You didn't ask if if it looks different. You asked if it if it will exist. I thought and and. Um, yeah, of course it'll look different. Yeah, everything's gonna look different. I mean, why do you mm -hmm. have to do? Yeah, of course. I mean, you can do everything over your cell phone. Organization through cell phones. Organization through, you know, whatever, whatever through your watch. Who cares? Doesn't matter what the doesn't matter what the vehicle is. I think we form so, a union tomorrow, Vic. You and I. I don't care which one's president, <laughs> vice president. I'll leave that up to you to decide if you want to go with the older man uh, or we go with the uh, more knowledgeable person of the two. And we negotiate with Tom on air live. For the tasty live union what do you say if you don't want to do that i'll give you some food for thought if you want to don't want to do that vic you might have been too I, young i would love you guys i would love everybody in the world of finance to unionize sure why not bring it on i think it's great right, be careful what you ask for um <laughs> no, no, no. Vic, you might be too young for the for the for this next uh, point i'm going to make the last time we were going to rely on uh, computers to do us bad the first kind of ai was all y2k 2000 and all the computers were going to revolt against us. They were going to shut down. Businesses were going to shut down. Banks were going to shut down. Everything was going to shut down. Nothing happened. Absolutely nothing happened. And I'm hoping that the machines are just as bad as they were in 2000, and they will listen to the humans, and nothing bad will happen. Yeah. What drives me crazy is people that think, you know, we should ever go back. My whole— No, Victor's 100 percent correct. I was just trying to help your point. My—I'm <laughs> always a person that thinks everything—remember my thing, Vic— Everything in the future is going to be better. Everything yeah, in the future is always going to be better. I think it depends on who you are. I mean, go go outside to some of the people uh, sleeping in tents in Humboldt Park and tell them the future is going to be better, man. Okay, think, you can I always think... you can always find your outliers. Not enough told me we're a sanctuary city. We just have to deal with it. You can always find. <laughs> that was his answer to me, Vic. I've already had this conversation. You can you. always find outliers everywhere. I hate when people bring up the outliers. Let's talk about like you do dislike. Hate is such a strong. Let's talk about the masses. Let's talk about the majority. Let's talk about everybody inside the distribution curve because that's the mm -hmm. real discussion.
And in that case, everything gets better. It Victor, there's a movie called Fist by Sylvester Stallone. I need you to watch it before we unionize tomorrow, okay? Fist, or, and also watch Rollerball. Remember that old movie from the 80s where the corporate, we don't, we don't, we don't uh, live in uh, geographic countries anymore. We live in, cor you know, countries that are run by corporations. Roll you United, know, they, they came out with the United a, States of NVIDIA, everybody. Mm -hmm. they, came out, they came out with a sequel to Rollerball. Wasn't the first Rollerball, um, uh, Kane, whatever his name is, um, Michael Kane? Yeah. That's the first Rollerball, Michael Kane. It's weird. I think if we stack our right. union board with a lot of needy people like my son, <laughs> I think we can get underneath Sazenov's skin oh, and he'll just end. He'll just go, all right, what do you guys want? I can't listen to you bullshit anymore.